Hello and welcome to an all new episode of Anime Brain Freeze. We are your regular shitbag hosts. I am John. And I'm CC. And when there's just too much cool anime to watch, we got you covered. We took a week off due to Thanksgiving and work schedules interrupting, but now we're back on track. Hope you all who celebrate that holiday uh, stuffed yourself with food and problematic family discussions to your heart's content. <laughs> Because now it's time to dive back into the colorful world of anime. Today I will rejoin shitbag anime Skeletor Eins and his monstrous MMO crew to uh, check out the third season of Overlord. And after that, uh, John and I will talk about the most relatable of shitbag gamers, uh, the lovely question mark uh, Chiu mm. <laughs> and the friends opponents who join her on her road to school. So let's get this show on the road as well. We'll be right back. All right, Overlord season three. Uh, as customary by now, I will not talk about uh, the basic series setup or staff in this continuous series review. If you want to know about the basics of Overlord, check out episode 52 of our show. That's uh, where I reviewed season one and two of this series. Uh, also, spoilers for season one and two gonna run rampant, and I'm uh, probably gonna freely talk about at least some key moments from uh, this third season as well, because I need to, to explain what did and didn't work for me this time. In general, we are maybe, probably, I mean, I haven't talked with John about this, but uh, uh, I at least want to talk um, more spoilers more often in reviews of continued seasons of a show we have covered before because by the time we cover them that particular season has wrapped up and if you don't want to know anything about the show why would you start with season two or three in the first place right so if it makes sense at least for those types of reviews i think it's more beneficial to be able to not dance around the bush uh, so much to discuss some of the more substantial developments of long long running shows like that so yeah yeah it makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I was a bit miffed that we didn't like deep dive really into uh, season three of My Hero Academia after we finished that recording, and was like, man, I wished I could have, you know, talked more like concrete about some of those <laughs> things that happened, and we didn't like, you know, weren't being so vague on some of that stuff. But well, uh, we'll have our chance in season four. Yes, thankfully. Um, but still, um, that's what we intend to. And that out of the way, let's do a quick recap to remember where we are in the story of Overlord at this point. So when we last left the MMO junkie Eins, who got whisked from his favorite pastime into a fantasy land and turned into a real-life OP wizard lich, uh, he had already undertaken the first steps toward increasing the size of his dominion. Uh, he subjugated a neighboring clan of lizardmen in the second season and joined them to his ranks. He fortified Karna village and made it into a bastion for human refugees and monsters alike. And he created an alter ego hero adventurer called Momon, who gained fame, fortune and admiration by accomplishing a bunch of MMO side quests, basically, and fending off one of his uh, minions in disguise, uh, who attacked the city on his order, kind of. Uh, and now he's ranked as probably the strongest of the adamantine class adventurers, which is already the strongest adventurer class out there. So things are not looking bad for him. Uh, meanwhile, the ruling forces of the kingdom of uh, Reestes, or Reestes, I don't remember how it's pronounced exactly, uh, where the tomb of Nazarek, Ein's home base, materialized, are still pretty oblivious to what's the danger brewing near them and are playing their own little political games and everything on the side. Uh, so as you can see, a lot of moving parts in terms of world building, which is definitely still one of the strongest parts in Overlord. It always has been. Uh, like slowly getting us and uh, Eins at the same time accustomed to the rules of this world and then progressively increasing the scope of the geography and the number of nations and factions and characters and giving them all different agendas and drives. Uh, this is still where the show does some of its best work in this season as well. I mentioned in my review of season two that things focused a bit too much on the world building and characters, side characters for me there, but only because it was such, you know, a stark contrast to the first season, which was very, like, focused on pretty much only Eins and his core crew of servants, the floor guardians uh, of Nazarek, and then... You know, they suddenly increased the number of characters and character relations and plot threads in the second season, like, tenfold, pro probably. 
which at that point felt somewhat like stitched together. Like, okay, we're going to dabble a bit into that character and that character, and now we'll see those again. It was nice seeing a lot of the side characters again and see like, oh, those are going to be like mainstay players, at least on the sides at this point. But it felt like, okay, we're losing side of Ainz a bit. And I still considered him and his main servants to be the main guys of the story. And we, we saw kind of very little of them in the second season. And that, that you know, that that didn't, I, I've, that felt a bit, I don't know, cobbled together for me at that point. But that was probably because I wasn't really seeing the big picture yet, much like Eins actually, <laughs> which, <laughs> you know, he is not an idiot at all, but he's still always one step behind the plans of his minions, mainly Albedo and uh, Demiurge, who, even if Eins didn't plan for it himself, which is most of the time, uh, interpret all of his wishes and improvised plans as grand machinations of world domination, <laughs> which they, of course, then steer all their efforts towards. And those moments are still the best sources of comedy in this series. Like when Eins um, is explaining uh, why he did a certain thing, like saving a village or not killing someone uh, to some of his minions who don't understand it. And then Alberto and Demi Urge are smirking like, you fools, do you really think that is Lord Ein's real reason for doing this? And the, <laughs> other, min and the other minions are like, oh, and Ein's is like, what? 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 And, uh, you know, then has to come up with a ploy to make his left and right hand guys explain his plan to him. Because, you know, he obviously has no idea what they, you know, s saw in his initial plans uh, and what they're going to do. So, you know, to keep a lid on that <laughs> and a grasp on that, he uh, has to think on his feet, uh, quickly on his feet. So, yeah, that's those those scenes are comedy gold and uh, made me laugh every time. Uh, but yeah, like I said, uh, often Eins doesn't really know where his or his minions plots are going. So why would I? Uh, but the show title says, says it all, really. Um, he's destined to become the overlord of this realm. There might be some turns and detours on the way, but that's what the show ultimately is going for. Um, him increasing his ranks and taking over. All on the admittedly flimsy premise that he's trying to find and reunite with some of his old cherished MMO buddies, who might have also been transported to this world, but that's not made clear, you know, that that's actually the case. <laughs> he's just, you know... Basing that on the fact that he is here and maybe they're there too and he wants like to rejuvenate his memories of the, the time they all played the game together and that's why he's doing this. Which is kind of pretty... I mean, it's understandable from an emotional point of view, especially if you consider that he was like a, I don't know, poor little basement nerd who didn't have much going for in his life except for maybe his, his MMO thing, right? And, uh, you know, he that's what he had, had his most fun time and memories of. And now that's gone and he wants to get that back. So, okay, I get it. But it's still kind of flimsy, especially considering what's happening in this season. It uh, It's not that convincing. But yeah, I'm, I'm glad to say that season three is much more straightforward in, you know, in that regard, in establishing what it is going for. A lot of the new characters introduced in Season 1 and 2 play an important role now, and uh, Eins takes some very big and important steps towards world domination. We're also a bit more focused on Eins and his, uh, and his core team again as well, and to an extent Enri and Neferia, who are the most important human members of the cast, probably, and who are basically the heads of Karna Village at this point, the village close to Nazarek. But that's also what I was missing in season two, and season three like immediately starts off by giving us a fun uh, Nazarick Floor Guardian episode, uh, which gets us reacquainted with the main players, and it's just goofy fun all around. And the best thing is probably Alberto summoning her demon steed for the first time and not being able to ride it, because it turns out she is a virgin succubus, because she wants to save herself for eins, you know? There is this thing about unicorns who can only be ridden by pure maidens. Well, hell horses can only be ridden by ladies who get down and dirty. So that <laughs> was kind of a great, mm. hilarious twist on that particular fantasy trope. She, you know, just can't do that. <laughs> M made me laugh. But after that, we uh, get a small arc of Ein setting some ogres and other monsters living in the area around Karna Village to his ranks. It's short and fun, but nothing really that substantial. You know, again, more world building. 
And then things get kicked into motion in a big way, though it doesn't seem so at first. Um, a noble from the neighboring empire of Baruth is uh, putting out a call for a bunch of adventurers to investigate a mysterious ruin in the kingdom of Riastas. Riastas? Riastas? Jesus, I don't remember how to pronounce this fucking, the name of this nation. Uh, <laughs> let's say Riastas. Which, of course, as it turns out later, that ruin that they are supposed to investigate is the tomb of Nazarick, uh, Ein's home base. So we get introduced again to a bunch of new characters and then learn where they will go. And immediately it's like, oh, oh no, these guys are so fucked. <laughs> they are so royally fucked. And the show is outright saying that too, because Eins is among the ranks of those adventurers, of course, under the guise of Momon. And when someone asks him if the adventurers will survive, he says, nah, they'll probably all die. And then, of course, quickly corrects himself, you know, to keep up appearances. But he knows what's gonna happen. And if the first season has told us anything, um, then that none of the side characters in the show are safe. Especially not your standard RPG party of adventurers, likable as they may be. And uh, we get introduced to such a group of four again, who are very sympathetic. Um, Overlord has always done a really good job at endearing us to new characters only to put them in harm's way in, uh, into a lot of danger and threaten to rip our hearts out by well literally ripping their hearts out and then the question as this arc progresses changes from are some of them gonna die to are all of them gonna die and um, this is where the show becomes the darkest it has ever been and takes a pretty definite stand on its main character so the adventurers enter the tomb and get confronted by Ein's forces and just from the setup this is interesting and different again because usually in a game or in another TV show we would only get the perspective of the adventurers and dungeon crawlers but this is one where we are basically seeing it all from the perspective of the final boss of the dungeon. And Ein's now more than ever is that final boss because this is the season where he finally becomes a full-fledged villain and will become irredeemable in the eyes of most viewers. Um, there is no gray area here anymore. The show doesn't necessarily seem to agree on that, <laughs> which is, you know, that's where some of my gripes with that show and that in this season lie. But for me, there is no coming back from what he does in this arc and more importantly, how he does it. And what it comes down to is our four new side characters facing off against Eins um, at the end of this part of the season, making some horrible misjudgments in regards to Eins' character, and not only getting slaughtered, but meeting very different, very cruel and disturbing individual fates. Um, the show was not for the faint of heart before, with all of its gore and brutality, but what happens to these adventurers in this arc definitely takes the cake. And it's not because Eins is necessarily... What, what he's doing is not necessarily because he has to keep up appearance in, in front of his minions. But he completely loses his cool and is being a giant asshole. And on the one hand, that is interesting because it means that the show is doubling down on its interesting perspective in, uh, you know, that the main protagonist of the series is a true bad guy. On the other hand, I wonder if the author plans to take Eins down for that in the end? Because if not, I see me dropping the show on the way, because who wants to see a genuine asshole succeed over and over again and kill innocent people left and right, like in the most cruel way possible without any comeuppance? I don't. <laughs> I really don't. So yeah, uh, this, I don't, mm. like building empathy for the main character of Overlord has been like always this difficult tightrope walk from the get-go. Until now they managed to make this work more or less by making him protect certain more relatable and endearing characters and mostly only kill people that are bigger assholes than he is. But this is a season where they drop the ball on this in my opinion. Maybe it's intentional and this is, and I can't believe I'm drawing that comparison and neither will you, uh, the Breaking Bad of anime, <laughs> and <laughs> you know, and eventually all all his scheming and ambitions and edgelord antics, you know, uh, will bite him in the ass. But at this point, I kind of doubt that. I have a feeling that the author wants to paint Eins at this edgy as this edgy badass. You're still supposed to root for, 
And after this season, I can't. I just can't. I get that his home is the most important thing to him and he wants to protect it and the memory of his old comrades and all at all costs. But like, come on, dude, chill the fuck out. You were just playing a dumb video game with some other dickheads. And man, boy, does he love to monologue about how a lot of people are about to die, but he doesn't feel anything because the only thing that matters is Nazarick. Like, cool, buddy. Keep on calmly breaking it all down in video game terms. Makes you look super awesome and edgy, not like a total psychopath at all. <laughs> Jesus, like, <laughs> I, I mean, I bet Eins and, um, what was his name? Uh, Eru from Knights and Magic would love to hang out together. That, that oh, was, a, God. that guy was a little sociopath as well. You had to remind me that existed. Yeah, they kind of are cut from the same cloth when it comes to their to relation to nerd stuff in games. Like, it's the most important thing! Ah! <laughs> my nostalgia, my memories! Uh, and you, how dare you invade this? How dare you insult my friendship with my, with my old comrades? I will kill you all and make you, like, the breeding ground for my minions. Oh, God. Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, he doesn't slaughter indifferently, like, there are some characters that he will protect, but it's mostly for selfish reasons, like buffing up his ranks or because he thinks they might come in handy later or just not worth his time or whatever. He considers strong characters to be nothing more than Pokemon or draws from a gacha game at this point, and that's not really sympathetic. Like, not a sympathetic trait at all. He is the true shitbag gamer. Like, he's the worst, wor <laughs> worst of the worst in that regard. He's like the true gamer gator. Uh, I don't know. Really. <laughs> all that ma all that matters is the fucking game. Fuck everything else. Fuck your humanity. It doesn't matter. I'm a cool edgelord. Uh, I'll abandon my humanity if it means I can protect the memories of my of my video game. Uh, Jesus. <laughs> nostalgia. <laughs> it's horrible. It's horrible. It, it, he, he really goes there in this season. And yeah, that's... That didn't work for me, at least not when it comes to, like, if the show expects me to, like, root for Eins in the coming seasons or whatever, I won't do that. I can't do that, because he showed his true colors, he showed what he truly is, a wimpy little piece of shit, uh, and, you know, what we, you know, could garner from his smaller logs early in the earlier season, but, you know, that he still did things there that were sympathetic and were, let me hope that he would, you know, go somewhere else, but he's not. He's going to be the villain of this. So if the show doesn't accept that and doesn't do something with that, um, I'll be disappointed. One thing that works in this, though, is subverting the standard party of adventurers, you know, that would be the protagonists and heroes in a standard RPG, uh, meet their tragic fate thingy, which at this point some shows have tried. Uh, old Whipping Boy Goblin Sarah did the same thing in its first episode, uh, at least. But I think it works much better here because we spent a lot more time with the adventurers beforehand. Um, Overlord also doesn't reduce the horror just to its graphic imagery, uh, but also, you know, to the uh, psychology behind it. And also we know a lot, a whole lot more about the villains in this story. They are the main protagonists in this. So we can see where they're coming from, even if we don't agree with their harsh methods. And at least they're not faceless random goblins. And that makes all of this and all the things happening here much more emotionally engaging and harrowing. And the fact that I got so mad at Eins for going full ruthless evil asshole because, you know, of his entitled gamer pride, because that got triggered so hard, speaks for the way they handled this here. And, you know, just on the virtue of converting this trope into something else uh, or subverting it, they did a good job. Of course, it sucks to suggest that it only matters when people die in a show if you got to know them, you know, well beforehand. But it definitely makes the difference between, well, this sucks and it being uh, legitimately heartbreaking, which it was in this case. Uh, I still don't like this turn of events because I really liked Eins and his gang before this. But if, uh, if that's what they wanted to do, they did a good job with it. And... Of course, Goblin Slayer uh, might be doing something like that later in its runtime as well. I'm only talking about how it went about tearing down that trope in its first episode. But it did wo not work for me there 
And uh, especially not when compared to Overlord's later events, because it was only focused on the shock and awe of, of it all. Uh, and, you know, the brutality and the gore and stuff like that. And making that the main source of horror, which I think Overlord does a much better job at that. So if you watch Goblin Slayer and like it, please feel free to write a comment and let me know if Goblin Slayer does something more along those lines later on as well. And also manages to bring some more interesting antagonists into the picture than random goblin hordes. But yeah, after these major turn of events um, in Overlord, Eins basically goes into all-out attack mode. His casters, uh, Aura and uh, Mare, pay the Emperor of the Bahar with Empire a visit, say hello by killing a bunch of knights in his uh, castle at once, and invite him to Nazarick to clear up this mess, um, which is what he does. Uh, he's not like a random wimp or anything. He's actually a very clever guy. Uh, Emperor Jernif uh, Rune Farlord El Nix. Yep, that is a light novel anime name for sure. <laughs> Good grief. <laughs> anyway, since he's a very smart schemer himself, he quickly realizes that his um, empire is royally fucked if he doesn't play nice with the guys from Nazarick. Um, so that is what he does, all the while, like, already planning to search for someone who can take down someone like Eins, which, even though the show hasn't really gone there yet, because Eins is still the most OP character in this universe, is not impossible, I guess? Uh, Jirknif states to one of his people that there were enough powerful people in that room, and he's talking about the Floor Guardians, of course, that if they all banded together, they could take Eins down. So his plan for now is maybe to pull one of them to his side, which... The show immediately clarifies is a fool's errand because the Floor Guardians are 100% loyal to Eins and have naturally already accounted for such a ploy by um, Jirknif. But that doesn't mean that there isn't someone in this world who can take Eins down, especially if some of his MMO friends made it over and maybe one of them isn't a, you know as big of a dig as he is. Which I hope is something that will happen. I really want the show to introduce an opponent for once that Eins isn't two steps ahead of, because if he isn't Demiurge and Albedo R, which granted is hilarious, especially if he has an you know, inner freak out about it in his uh, real wimpy voice, but it kind of kills any amount of suspense, like for the sake of keeping up the power fantasy that is Eins and his character. And it also makes some of the confrontations in the show a bit disappointing. For example, the finale of the season, like Eins is Basically, after some political maneuvering from Jirknif, he Eins comes out of the closet, so to speak, and declares himself the Sorcerer King Eins Ulgaon and intends to take over the kingdom of uh, Riestis, uh, which leads to a pretty epically staged massacre, which has got some really scary and uh, unnerving imagery in it, and a confrontation that has been kind of built up from the first season. Uh, but since Eins is so fucking OP that confrontation can really only go one way, and it does very quickly and unceremoniously, and that, you know, while sticking to its rule set, is still very anticlimactic. Like, I was hoping for more, because this is a very important moment in the show, just, you know, story and plot-wise, and the character he has a confrontation with was there from the first season, and I hope to see more out of that character, and I expected more of that him, and I didn't get that, and it was really disappointing. I kind of packed him for the guy who, you know, could make a serious dent into, uh, you know, Ein's armor and plants, but alas, not even a scratch. <laughs> not even remotely. And, you know, it had to happen that way uh, because he didn't get a significant power boost or anything, you know, that that had to happen for Eins to take a beating, but yeah, that was that was a real anticlimax, and I was like, okay, oh, that's a shame, man. I mean, there's still some leftovers, you know, from that particular cast of characters that could turn out to be what I am hoping for, what I'm rooting for. But that person was the first one I I hoped for would be that, and he's not. He definitely isn't. Um, what is also very anticlimactic is the CG in this third season. <laughs> My, my favorite whipping boy. Mm -hmm. um, especially for the foot soldiers, goblins and ogres. It's really bad. This is berserk level of hideous. Mm. Uh, yeah. Uh, the CG worked all right in the first season because it was used more sparsely and effectively, especially in the case of Momon's battle scenes for, you know, some neat 
wild camera pans and such, which is my favorite use of CG in anime. But it has been used too much in the second and third seasons to overlook its glaring shortcomings. And uh, there is a particular moment in the last couple of episodes that should be really awesome in theory and considering how it is staged. But it falls a bit flat because it all looks so hilariously cheap and shitty. <laughs> there, there's a pretty prominent gif out there uh, of that encounter um, on the web. I don't know how, how I could make you search, <laughs> but maybe search for overlord shitty CG dot, uh, GIF and uh, maybe we'll find it. And the shitty CG doesn't downright destroy the show like it doesn't berserk. Like that was really like everything about that show was aces, but the bad CG just dragged it down and made it unwatchable. That is not the case here. Not at all. But it's still a sore thumb that's sticking out way too often and I wish it wasn't in there at all. But yeah, that's where we are at the end of season three. Uh, Eins is without a question, for me at least, the main villain of the series now. So far, nobody has entered the picture who has even a sliver of a chance to take him down. Or even on. The people in his own ranks excluded. Uh, Shaltier came very close in uh, in the show's first season. Uh, if that cheating shitlord Eins hadn't used pay-to-win items. Uh, let's not forget that, ever. <laughs> Uh, but the question remains, where do we go from here? Will we get another 26 episode of Ein slowly taking over this world and killing anyone who threatens the shrine of his stupid MMO guild? I hope not. Uh, it's definitely time for an old friend of Ein's to make an appearance in this uh, world. Like, show up on uh, Ein's doorsteps to tell him that, you know, what an asshole he has become and then kills him. Or maybe it's going to be a character that Ein's hasn't, really accounted for like the show is doing a thing towards the end which makes me believe that a certain character has the hidden potential and magical prowess to overthrow eins eventually which given who that character is now would be pretty damn great i will admit that if they really built that character up to be the eventual like i don't know final the actual protagonist of the show or the antagonist of eins at least <laughs> Uh, that would be amazing. That would be great. Uh, I'm not sure about that yet, though, if that's what they're going for. Uh, but yeah, so they can take their time getting there, but I need to know that this is what's going to happen. Or I can see myself dropping the series on the way, because as much as I like the atmosphere, world, and characters in the show, I don't want to see Eins come out on top at the end. I want to see. I don't want to see him succeed. I don't want to... Him, he can have his, you know, his kingdom is ruined, everything. But then once he is at the top of his game, of his success, whatever, he has finally become the overlord. I want someone to be there to take him down. Like, let him see what, you know, that everything he did was in vain and he could have been a force for good, a much better character. Show it, you know, <laughs> let it play out all before his eyes in his final moments and then, like, cut his head off or something. And let him cry for mercy. I don't know. He deserves that at this point. I want to see him ground into the dust and be exposed as the wimpy little entitled shitbag gamer that he is. Uh, if the show does that, it will be immensely satisfying. But right now, I'm not sure we're ever going to get that. Ever going to get there. So yeah, we'll see where this goes. It was still mostly fun this time around. I'll say that. I was not bored. I enjoyed my time with the season. I didn't like everything they did with it and with the characters, but I was entertained, um, uh, even thrilled in some parts and on the edge of my seat. So I'm willing to see where it goes a bit longer. But if Eins doesn't get some serious opposition soon to even the playing field, I consider this experiment failed. So we go from all of that to your truly everyday average, n absolutely unquestionably normal daily trip to school, Lucio's school road. Mm -hmm. there's, there's Nothing to see here. There's never anything out of the ordinary. <laughs> In fact, why would you even watch this show? Nothing is happening at all. Yeah, I know, right? It's just, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, Chio Miyamo is your average, everyday high school girl. Except her commute to school is anything but, oh, going back on what I just said. Oh, oh no, we lied. <laughs> That's that bait and switch. That's how you get the clicks. Mm -hmm, and we were so convincing. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Uh, sometimes she has odd off-color conversations with her friends Manana and Yuki, uh, encounters with the leader of a biker gang and his troublemaking little sister, or other weird shenanigans. Each day is a new adventure and just trying to get to school and not having to deal with anyone else's nonsense. Mm. I mean, this show has a very simple setup. And it, it's just, you know, a very sort of straightforward comedy show, I felt. I don't know about you. Yeah, but, uh, definitely. Like, and it's set in, all, it has the same setting for every episode. And it's mm. you going to school. <laughs> And you I've... would be surprised what things can happen on your way to school. I was surprised. I can tell you. Holy shit. <laughs> this show. Oh, man. So we talked uh, a few seasons back about um, Hana Matsuri, Hina Matsuri, excuse me, and how it started off pretty funny and then it sort of petered out after the first few episodes. I feel like this show, I, I laughed at least a little bit each episode. So as a comedy, I feel like it was a success. Yeah, there are definitely some, you know, some, let's say, more low-key episodes in terms of comedy, but there's still something witty, uh, imaginative in all of them. And then there are these, like, highlight, gut-buster, laugh-out-loud episodes in there that are just, you know, beat, uh, like, like... Great gags by the minute, uh, jo uh, jokes everywhere, and fun references, and the characters being amazing in how <laughs> shitty they are, and yeah, it's it's great stuff. Everyone is everyone is a weirdo for different reasons in this show, and it it just it just plays to how funny it is. Yeah, like uh, including Chio introducing herself to. Uh, the fierce biker boss, uh, Mayuta Ando, under the name Brady Butterfly. <laughs> and, you know, that was definitely one of the highlights of the early episodes. Like, that, I was re-watching that with two of my friends, uh, like, after the show started airing and they hadn't seen it yet. And we were, I had seen it for the second time and I was still lying on the ground and so were they, like, laughing our asses off. As one of the most, like, compact most funny like i don't know how long that scene is i think eight, eight mm. episodes uh, eight, eight minutes or something maybe Ish, uh, yeah. like yeah i've seen an anime in a while it's like so like <laughs> the way things develop and go wrong for chio in that particularly moment and how how she adapts to that is just so fucking amazing and hilarious and well written and uh yeah it's it's great and that's definitely that's definitely the moment where i was firmly hooked i mean the first episode was already funny and i liked its quirky like a uh, sense of humor immediately but that was the moment that got me firmly on board how for how over the top it went how funny it was and how well uh it played its character cards mm. i don't know was it the same for you oh yeah definitely i think what uh really hooks me in pr pretty much each uh scenario in the show was Everything was always about how much further out of hand can this situation get, and you and you, you never expect it. <laughs> the, the, this show is, you know, you say uh, expect the unexpected. Yeah, yeah, mm. that's this show. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And you know, I mentioned before the episode, uh, the the series is full of references. This is very. It has a very heavy focus on game-related stuff at times. Like, Chiu is an avid gamer. Um, particular kind, which is maybe yeah. not that regular in Japan, because she's really heavily into Western games. And that is also a very interesting aspect of the show. Like, the view <laughs> of this show on Western and Japanese games is hilarious <laughs> and insightful. Like, the Japs taking up both, like, your standard Western shooter and its fan base and player base and everything and how they behave. And, you know, your standard Japanese games. And, you know, there's a Jap at, at Boys Love Games in there that is super creative and funny. It's a hilarious episode and, you know, gets even dragged out to more coming episodes in regards to how that develops some of the characters and what they do because of, uh, of that <laughs> and it's amazing. Uh, yeah, that, I think it was had some really, really good stuff. If you know your name, uh, your way around with your video games, like a lot of, 
like in-depth joke poked at uh, that particular genre that worked really well. Not, mm. you know, just in terms of, hey, here's a reference to a game. Like, you, oh, what show did that? You know, just throwing a reference in there, but not really tackling the subject all that interesting. I can't think of the name of it. Hmm. I think mm. we've mentioned it before on the show. Mm, <laughs> yeah, I, I think, you know, it's just... <laughs> ah, it's on the tip of my tongue. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, you know, mm. I, I don't, I don't, rem I don't remember. I don't quite remember. Oh well, <laughs> shit happens. Anyway, this show is really good at that. I don't know what was your your favorite uh, reference in that regard or thing they did. Can you think of something offhand? I mean, they came out swinging in the first episode with her being like. I'm going to parkour around these buildings because I play totally not Assassin's Creed. And I'm like, oh, this is the direction we're going. Okay. I'm all right with that. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> or later on when she's like, man, why are Western games so focused about saving America? Well, I finished the game, so you better thank me, America. It's like, <laughs> what are you on about? And she, like, adapting all the different characters you know from certain western games like she becomes basically chio fisher at some point uh, that's right i forgot oh my god i forgot that one <laughs> <laughs> going full splinter cell on everyone's asses there's an amazing scene oh god that made me laugh so hard um the smartphone grandma that is yes. in front of the shore it's just <laughs> fucking and you think, oh, that's so like so sweet, and <laughs> where should they they come up with this very convincing story of why she's sitting in front of that store, <laughs> and then it turns out, nope, that's not it at all. <laughs> the so show is so good at taking certain things, like setting up an expectation for that, and then completely turning that on its head, like making like, no, that's not at all what's happening here. <laughs> you were completely wrong. You might have seen this before somewhere else, but this is not it. And that's really good. Like, the, the comedy derived from that uh, from that source is, is amazing and amazingly well put together. Like I said, some of the stuff is slower and, you know, it's not all laugh out loud, but it, it's least worth the chuckle. And some scenes, you know, like I mentioned, the smartphone grandma are, like, hilarious to the max. It's amazing. Uh, the episodes with Madoka and she wants to do uh, th this weird contact sport kabaddi and mm -hmm. she just really kind of wants to feel up the other girls and it's it's out there. She makes everything uncomfortable for everyone else and it's mm -hmm. just the show goes pl it goes places man. I don't it's, it's having fun with it. Yeah, it, it really does. Um, like, I don't know about like a complete subversion of expectations every, t every no, time no, no, you no, watch. No. It but. plays something straight too. But, you know, that's, that, that's why it, when it doesn't, it works incredibly well <laughs> also. The, the show, I, I, one thing I like about it is they break up the episodes pretty nicely. So, that, you know, you're not lingering on one uh, set of jokes or one gag for too long. You know, you've got these sort of like uh, two or three part like uh, vignettes in each episode. So, you know, you, you, you always get a little something different each time and you get to see pretty much all of the characters in equal measure, which I thought was uh, pretty cool. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there those are some good characters. Like, it's not only Chio, but uh, you already mentioned Madoka, uh, but you know there is there is a lot of uh, interesting st uh, character work in here. Like uh, Chio's best friend Manana, who's like the the worst person. Like, She's a giant shitbag. Holy shit! Like I mean, Chio is, <laughs> is a shitbag too, and there is a reason that those two are friends. Like <laughs> their friendship is very real and also phony. But, you know, you can see why these two characters stick together because, like, they're a bird of a feather. Like, they're the same kind of person in one way or another. Uh, but Manana is, like, one step worse than Chiu. And the stuff, when that doesn't work for her and, you know, it flies in her face and the way these two ups try to upstage each other, sometimes actually being friends and then trying to make each other look like assholes for, for shits and giggles. All of that is great. And it gets developed. I was surprised to see, like, some of the stuff gets payoff in later episodes. And I was like, okay, that's, that, that's great. Like, uh, Shinozuka, a character that gets introduced 
much later in the season. Um, her story was weirdly heartfelt, and I was like, "Oh, th mm. this is sweet. Like, okay, this is kind of, kind of sad and sweet. <laughs> like, I did not expect from this show." And you know, uh, Ando, who they introduce uh, as this, who feels like this one-off, <laughs> funny uh, character who is just there to get made, you know, into turned into a loser by by Chiro, kinda. Or who gets dragged into her web of, of nonsense, uh, then turns out to be an actually, you know, cool guy and a uh, romantic interest for Chiyo. Well, I, at least I, one way. <laughs> I kind of got to wonder about that because I was sort of looking at their friendship and I was like, well, wait, are they, this, are they the same age? Because they don't, and that, that, something that feels like doesn't need to be explored because of the nature of the show but uh, it, it just was sort of there yeah pinging me in the back of the head like it could be should this guy be should it... i don't know i mean it's like you can you can never really tell an em uh, in anime because you know sometimes the you know the the 14 year old uh, dudes look like 35 year olds and <clears throat> The, the the 30 year old girls looked like 12 year olds so i don't know it, they never clearly state their ages or at least ando doesn't i think so no. so it could be i don't know but he's def he definitely falls for shio or bloody butterfly in the beginning <laughs> uh and you know they do something with that and also again great source of comedy and one of the thing i loved about this show is where you know, your standard more tropes of the girls being cute, uh, cute and, you know, being... You got these standard scenes where they seem to be, like, kind of innocent and flustered and they're drawn all cute and everything. That happens in this show as well, but it's all for the sake of a joke. <laughs> you know, that at the end usually makes the girls look like idiots or assholes. And, you know, there's a scene where Ando does something sweet for Chiu and everything, and she's like, oh, my God. Uh, I don't know if it was something where she was... A, acting like she was afraid that he's hurt or something. And then at the end, it turns out she's only manipulating him <laughs> like for some specific reason. Uh, I, I need to look up what exactly happened there and how that played out. But that was also incredibly funny where it's like, oh, right. Is she really like, is, oh, is she also like falling for him? Is she, does she like him? No, no, no. <laughs> she, <laughs> she has, there's only one reason she is doing that. Like there's only one reason and that's for her own gain. But, you know, the, se the series doesn't play it like that from the beginning. And then at the end, it's like, oh, this is what is actually going on. And that was so nice because it kind of, I don't know if it was attention, but I think it was. It kind of sets you up to expect like the standard behavior you get from other straightforward, more, more shows where you got a bunch of cute girls who, you know, act a specific way and are supposed to make you, the viewer, root for them, feel for them, maybe in some cases fall in love with them. You know, there are a lot of, enough people out there. And then in this show, it shows you, oh, you fell for a complete act. This is all an act. It just shoots you down at every angle, basically. It, exactly. This girl is a shitbag that is playing with you. <laughs> and the show is. And that's, you know, what some of the other shows in that genre do as well. Because the girls are only, like, drawn that way, characterized that way, acted that way. Because, you know, they want to uh, endear the character to you to make you pay for model kits, whatever. Like, pull the pull the money from your pockets, like... You know, stuff like that. And this is what the show, what, what Chiu plays to uh, and makes fun of in m many times during its runtime. Like showing you, oh, duh, isn't that a cute girl? And look how she's behaving. And then, nope, she's a shitbag. <laughs> <laughs> Better believe it. She's not endearing at all. Kind, She kind of is, but she also, also isn't. She's a horrible person. And a lot of that feels like surprisingly real. Like... I felt all of these characters in there as quirky and as weird and as crazy as their antics become in certain parts felt really relatable and real. Like, especially uh, Chiyo and Manana's relationship. I think that friendship, like, taking constantly taking jabs at each other, having probably a truly emotional bond that both of them can't really commit to, but that still is there... 
but only manifesting in them, you know, being together all the time and taking jabs at each other and making fun of each other. That felt like definitely like some of the friendships that I have had in my life. And yeah, I don't know. How, how, did, how did that work for you? Kind of reminds me a bit of the really weird quote unquote friendships and relationships that we saw in Kono Suba. Yeah, definitely. There's some of because, the uh, stuff in Kono I mean, Suba. They're all friends, but, you know, they treat each other like idiots because yeah. why not? That's yeah. what you do to friends. I think I think Chiu is is even a bit more mean spirited than Konosuba in some parts. I mean, I've only watched the first season of Konosuba to be fair, for uh, until now at least. But some of the stuff Malala and Chiu do is really mean. Like it's really, <laughs> really, really mean. I don't know how many times I was sitting on uh, on the couch and was like, "Oh no! Oh, that's so that's so evil! Oh, you evil person!" It was funny, but it was evil. And uh, yeah, uh, but, but you're right. Is that there's is that there's come up and for each other because you know. Oh yeah. Oh you, oh, you got me for this. Oh, just you wait. <laughs> you know the thing I want from Overlord happening, like the the, the evil schemes and machinations biting the main character in the ass that ha constantly happens in Shio School Road. Like, damn, <laughs> <laughs> everything they got laid out. It was like, oh, come off with these like giant ass complicated elaborate complicated plans to make themselves not look like idiots like completely falls apart and makes them like look like the biggest assholes and yeah that's done so magnificently in the way it's staged in in the way it's like uh in the way it's scripted in the way it's framed and directed like you know one of the best things in that regard in the first ep uh, early episodes uh, that we already mentioned was the thing where uh, chiu meets ando um, the other thing is where she meets um, the the classroom idol character, basically, and uh, wants to become her friend. Uh, oh, Yuki, yeah. Y yeah. And then it's like this weird situation that we... I can speak that I had the situation before, where she is waving... Uh, Yuki is waving at her. <laughs> and she doesn't know how to react because... You know, if you consider uh, that each classroom, you know, in high school has a social standing, you know, there's some people at the top who hang with the cool kids, some are in the middle who are not, you know, really noteworthy, and then there's like the low class. She was kind of like in the middle, she is not really a person that people hang out with, she is like inconspicu uh, inconspicuous and everything. She's not someone that, uh, you know, anyone would take a second look at. And then su suddenly this incredibly popular nice person waves to her and she's like wait is she waving at me oh i want to wave back because i want to become her friend obviously and then she thinks oh wait maybe someone is behind me who is an actual friend of hers and i uh, if i if i wave back at her now i make a complete ass of myself and that like results into this fucking like her meltdown in her head where she's like <laughs> oh my god what am i going to do how am i going to get out of this situation if I don't wave back of her, if, because if someone isn't behind me right now and I don't wave back at her, she might get super angry at me and have no chance of being a friend uh, uh, with her ever again. And then she like tries to like process all the different possible angles, how she can get out of the situation, like in this instant in her head. And I definitely feel like I have been there before in my high school life. Like mm. that felt so real to me. I was like, oh my God, yeah, this is... This is true to nature. This is amazing. And I have done some stupid stuff to get out of situations like these. And not something like she does. I, I was never such a creative person. I like my head off to her. Like, holy you shit. Literally throwing yourself in the garbage. Diving headfirst into the garbage. Res <laughs> yeah. Or, or respect to you, Cheer. That's an amazing scene. But yeah, it was like, mm, god damn, that is well done. And felt, again, super relatable. And... Yeah, I made me like so endeared to this character. Even, especially later in the season, she often sh shows her true colors. She is not a good person. Well, she is a good person, but she's also shit back. You know, you can be both. Uh, you don't always have to be an Eins. You can also be a Chio. Uh, you know, <laughs> good person deep down, but a shit back on the outside. So yeah, that's what she is. But you know, occasionally you see the person she is deep down underneath 
And that is, you know, what you... Then I'm also indeed... Uh, to be fair, I'm also endeared to her shitbagness. Like, that's also a fun part. I wouldn't like... I don't know if I would like to hang out with such a person all the time. Mm-hmm. Or, you know... Uh, you know, if I would want to be friends with such a person, because that sounds really taxing. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But, but it's fun to see her work and do her thing. And, you know, Manana, the same account for, uh, accounts for Manana and something like, you know, and some of these other characters. You know, there are a lot of side characters in the show that are super funny and stuff gets super dark. Like this one character that becomes the sensei of Madoko later. <laughs> Who's like, oh, he's the hidden master of comedy, blah blah blah, and they they do had the standard thing where it's like, oh, this hidden master warrior and stuff. No, it turns out he was like a fucking guy who groped underage high school girls in the train and got imprisoned and then lost his job and is now living as a fucking homeless person. And it's like, and that all happens like in, in the brink of an eye, where it's like, oh. Oh, okay, this guy has a hidden side to him. He's really cool. He's not just a homeless guy. No, no, he's an actual bad person. <laughs> he's he's a really shitty cr- character and a creepy dude. And it's like, what the fuck? <laughs> Coming out of nowhere. <laughs> but it's super hilarious. And um, yeah, the show just never ceases to surprise me with how weird, how, you know, creepy, how, uh, I don't know, out there how uh yeah how quirky and uh, how real it could become i don't know do you have a favorite moment in this show not in terms of just the game references but you know everything like something i don't know certain character development or you know a certain mini story or something that happened oh yeah yeah i i just saw that when um chio and manana find the um used cigarette but Oh yeah! Oh, fucking amazing! The, and another one of my favorites is, um, "Hey, what's something you always wanted to do?" You know, I always kind of wanted to be alongside one of the person in a car when they toss their cigarette out the window. Just toss it right back in the window and say, "Hey, you dropped this," <laughs> and she has her opportunity and <laughs> fucks it up. <laughs> Spectacularly <laughs> fucks it up. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she fucks it up. Could be like the subtitle of the show. Yeah. She school wrote. She fucks it up uh, every time. Every time. Uh, and you, you would think, you know, like I said, that could be boring. It's like, oh, this is gonna go horribly wrong. But the fun part is how it goes horribly <laughs> wrong, and that's always different, and always creative, and always incredibly funny. And yeah, I, I loved, I loved the, uh, I loved how. But I love this show. I love this show. I loved. I loved how it great. was set up. Yeah, it was I, so much fun. I mean, I already liked um, the the surrealist humor of um, Haven't You Heard I'm Sakamoto, which which this show kind of dabbles in in that kind of comedy. But she goes like further. It's not just non sequitur humor. A lot of, like I said, a lot of the stuff in this show is getting set up for. I wouldn't necessarily call it the long game because there's not like a. A, a plot thread or something that is running through you only get like two or three short story bits in each episode and uh, those could be playing out at any time kind of but you know you have recurring recurring characters and those develop you know some events make those characters change and develop further and everything there's not really a through line here except for Chio herself maybe mm. but you know there's enough happening that it doesn't feel that this show is always starting from the same point from the same status quo and that's cool like it slowly builds a world around these characters and always shows you something new about this world and new characters in there and how those relate to other characters so the world building in the show is great as well like there there is there was so much more to the show than i initially thought and they did so much more with what they had which is not really a lot (laughs) Mm. you know when you look at the premise uh and uh yeah i i um i was i was engaged from beginning to end like we said there were some low-key episodes but you know i was i was never bored i don't know if you were at some point no i i i got a laugh at least once each episode and like i said earlier i'd consider it a success on that front because that's what it was going for to be a comedy 
it helps if you are like like we said invested in video games because a lot of jokes are derived from that when it comes to how Chiu behaves and what her let let's say what her train of thought is and mm. why it goes a certain way because she's clear a lot of her actions are clearly inspired uh, inspired by what she does in her free time her gene and also, brain as she calls it yeah exactly <laughs> max once you go maximum game brain you can't go back <laughs> Yeah, she has burned all bridges in that regard. But uh, sure. yeah, d you know, that's also a lot of responsible for a lot of her downfalls, and <laughs> a lot of her shortcomings when it comes to character interaction, but also for some of the best comedy. So yeah, if, you know, if we didn't, both of us didn't have that, I don't know if we were, would have been that engaged with the show uh, or as engaged with the show as we were. Mm. You know, the, the, the joke... Um, thickness i don't know what the right word is joke mass i guess wouldn't be as high uh for us or maybe wouldn't have worked as well but if you are uh, if you you know part of that particular kind of fandom uh at least in some regard and know some uh, know your way around games a bit then you get so much more out of this show but that's not to say that there is not enough in this show that works aside from that mm. like, like i said the character interactions and you know a, a lot of the non sequitur uh, humor out there, weird high school comedy stuff, and uh, you know things that happen that might have happened to you in your real life <laughs> on your way to school. You know some of those things just happen, and some of the people you might have run into as well. Some of those character tropes and uh, they run into, and uh, some of these weird situations those characters get into. Maybe you were into as well, uh, at least in some regard or in some variation. So yeah, this just, like I said, this show just feels super relatable. It just feels like, okay, maybe I'm not that main character. I'm not that weird, I hope. Uh, but, <laughs> but you know, some of the situation she was in sound familiar, look familiar. And uh, yeah, that's always, that's always good. It makes you, it makes you feel for that character. It makes you relate to that character. And it makes you want to see where they go. Even, like I said, if there's no really, not really a coherent story in the show. Mm. And, I, I mean, I feel like, uh, this was very much a labor of love show because mm -hmm. number one, uh, the original uh, author, Tadataka Kawasaki, I mean, a lot of the stuff he's done before this has just been like dojin stuff, like uh, uh, hentai stuff, let's say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That explains a lot, you know, <laughs> but, uh, kind of everything. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and the director, the scriptwriter, and the scene composition uh, person were all the same person. Oh, so this okay. was probably run on a, I mean, the obviously, you know, if you watch the show, you see that the animation isn't always there, but that's fine. It because, you know, it doesn't need to be. That's not the kind of story that needs super great fluid animation. Right, right. So you could tell this was uh, done with a smaller crew, uh, probably because it was done by the studio Dio Media, who we've brought up a few times before with like a Aho Girl, Girlish Number. Uh, we haven't really talked about some of their other stuff like Hitamari Sketch, Kantai Collection, or Squid Girl, but you know, they do have a decently sized body of work. And, and I feel like this was just sort of a, I will work on this for ha-has between other stuff, which kind of makes me feel like it was the sort of uh, production that uh, TQ was just very small and just and because we could sort of thing yeah <laughs> so I, but they I, seemed they seem to be like very familiar with uh, with comedy stuff like that seems to be their bread and butter yeah so they know like the people working there know how to you know Adapt certain things. I don't know. Was the source material a manga? Was this an anime only project? It was a manga. I believe it's. I believe it's still running. There was a volume that came out back in September, so I believe there's still more coming. That's good because that means we might get uh, another season down the road, and it's the story is like set up in a way that because there's basically isn't a story that uh, you know you could always get more episodes and have a lot more fun with those characters and, you know, see where they go. Mm. So, yeah, that, that sounds good. But yeah, that definitely, and even if, even if we say that the animation is not really elaborate, it never, in my opinion, never looked super cheap or anything. Yeah, it, does, like, it definitely was, doesn't take away from it. 
No, not at all. Like there's maybe some scenes with, with I don't know running cycles or something where where stuff looks more limited. But you know, every time it needs to do a certain thing, look a certain way to, for to make a joke work, it does that like mm. very effectively. Like all for the sake, you know, all, to make the comedy work, everything in this show like works really well. And, like the animation is servicing that perfectly, in my opinion. And uh, all the punchlines that need to land do land. Uh, and a lot of that is because of the snappy animation, uh, the snappy direction and uh, staging and scene composition and everything. So, yeah, they the people who worked on this know, knew what they were doing. So I think that shines through in this production. And the show is better for it. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> I also like that the... The final credits of the show uh, are, are like outtakes, like if it was yes. a live action show, like like maybe a Jackie Chan movie or something. And they made like this particular thing at the end where it's like, oh, this was like if these characters were really on set of a show and this was filmed and we got alternate lines for everything, how how they fucked up <laughs> something. And you would hear <laughs> maybe laughter from, from the crew and cast at that point. And that that was also like a fun little bit. I really enjoyed. I thought, oh man, that's that's clever. That's cool. I've I've never seen this before. That's th what I thought often during, during, while watching this show. Oh, I've never seen this before. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I man, great. What a what a great little surprising endearing show out of nowhere. Like yeah. I I had not had have heard any build up for this show. Before I watched the first episode, I didn't have any anticip anticipation. I had no expectations going into this. And I was so positively surprised. I was, yeah. I'd blown away is the wrong word because, you know, like we said, animation is like, like what? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's a comedy show. It's it's very simple. Uh, but, yeah, it's done so well. It, it shines where, where it has to and more than I ever could expect it to. Mm. Yeah, I remember seeing this listed on live chart because that's usually where I look and see what's coming up each season. And I was like, ah, you know, I'll check this out. Maybe it'll be a thing. And, you know, it, it definitely was a thing. And I think we both enjoyed it quite a bit. Oh, yeah. It's definitely a top contender for top of the season for me. Mm. Uh, best of the season. Sorry, misnaming our own segment here. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, uh, you know... Um, We'll see uh, if it actually turns out uh, to be that. <laughs> we won't. I, I, uh, I haven't decided yet. Only if you think this is a spoiler for the final episode of the season, uh, I, I'm not there yet. So um, yeah, but definitely, t selling like saying that already means a lot, just in terms of what the show is and and how it's put together. And if you want to have a good laugh, if you like comedy. If you like weird, quirky characters, if you like video games, if you like jokes about high school, about high schoolers, about, you know, teenagers doing dumb things in a clever way, not like super dumb. I mean, there's super dumb stuff in there, but that's mainly because the characters act in a very dumb way. But the way that's put together is uh, very, very clever most of the time. So, yeah, I please check out this show. It's definitely one of the comes highly re recommended one of the most recommendable shows in this season especially because it's so short each episode is like split up into small little segments and uh you know there's some there's not really that much fan service stuff in there i mean there's you know the comedy stuff which definitely goes there and uh, you know the the episode where where yuki uh is is like kind of not really pressured but turns out to be an exhibitionist I guess <laughs> she uh, just needs that little push, and she's like, "I'm there. Let's go." Yeah, that that happens for her, like for many things. Uh, guess she's too good for this world, but has a hidden side. Uh, but yeah, that is in there. You get a lot of panty shots in this, which I don't know why. I guess that's because where you know the the creator came from. That's one of the remnants there. Maybe, but yeah. But, but it never is like on the level that it feels gross or or super exploitative or anything. Mm. Uh, most and mostly it's used to you know for jokes and not played straight or creepy. And if it's played creepy, it's again for a joke, uh, like with the with the weird homeless guy, uh, the chi the Chican master. Um, yeah, and you know I came out of the show all around with with very positive and good feelings. 
very happy every time you know if i was in a bad mood after watching an episode of the show i wasn't anymore <laughs> <laughs> which you know this i think this is i guess not all you can ask for but most you can ask for from, from a comedy show like making you laugh making you feel good having a good time and maybe you know giving you in certain episodes more than you expected and uh, some some heartfelt stuff even in there even if it's incredibly goofy but yeah i i recommend the show i think everyone should watch it who who likes to laugh uh john you are the same i assume yeah i mean if you're looking for something with a little bit of off color humor it's it's great and you can uh you can go check it out on Ye old crunchy roll and Funimation, if you are so inclined. Oh shit! Yeah, we wanted to do that. I forgot to mention uh, that for Overlord, uh, I think Overlord season three is streaming on uh, on Crunchyroll as well. I'm not sure. I don't know, John. Where do I look this up? <laughs> hold on, hold on. I uh, uh because dot moe. That is the best source over. Overlord. Uh, Jesus. Uh, Crunchyroll, uh, Funimation, Hulu, Yahoo? Apparently, okay. And that all, only, I think, is that worldwide or is that only for the US? Um, oh, 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 you can change your region on because.moe. <laughs> um, Oh, I don't Jesus. know if we have any German listeners, but, you know, maybe it's interesting <laughs> for you guys as well. I should probably stick to the American audience because this show is in English and everything. And only because uh, uh, I don't uh, I don't hail from the U.S. doesn't necessarily mean that our listeners don't. So. Yeah, I mean, I when I'm going to reference where shows are airing, it's going to be obviously for the American region. But you can look up where shows are on because.moe, on live chart. I, to a certain extent on anime news network, sometimes they list the licensors and the show credits there. But yeah, I mean, I feel like we've reached a, a time where it's easy to look up whether or not you can watch any given show. But still, we wanted to, you know, mention uh, or start mentioning where the actual shows are streaming so that you can easily, you know, without doing some research, go mm -hmm. immediately after <laughs> listening to the show if you think you heard something that sounded good to you maybe like maybe you did in this case with overlord and uh, and uh, geo uh and check it out uh if you are subscribed to that particular service or it's a free service uh, and you can watch it for free i don't know depending on that um mm. i mean crunchyroll has a free model right i mean it's yeah. just you just you know, have to wait with some an extra week to watch shows yeah, but still, you know, by the time, uh, <laughs> by the time, by the time you listen to us, yeah, we got full. You know, we do full season reviews, so we're uh, that show will be completely available mm. uh, at and that give on that given service. So yeah, do that. Check out the services, like John said. Geo is on Crunchyroll, right? Okay, yep, and so, uh, and there's a simul dub on Funimation now. All right, I want to hear that is. But yeah, any last words on? Uh, this amazing little piece of comedy anime. Nope. <laughs> well, okay. That surprised me. And that's, uh, that's the best way to end this, I guess. See you guys next time. Take care, everybody. And that is a wrap on the 63rd episode of Anime Brain Freeze. All the music in our show is from the Double Dragon Neon soundtrack by the amazing Jake Kaufman. Please go to virt.bandcamp.com and check out his awesome work. Our show is available on most of the popular podcast services, but it's always worth visiting animebrainfreeze.com for our review index and some interesting articles linked in our episode release posts. Follow us on Twitter at AnimeBrainFreeze. We tweet regular updates and fun anime-related stuff there. Leave us comments and questions on Facebook and our YouTube channel, or send an email to animebrainfreeze at gmail.com. We would love to read your feedback. Thanks for tuning in, we hope you had a good time, and please join us again on our next show. Macht's gut! So long, y'all. Next time on Anime Brain Freeze! Fighting plastic models against each other, but this time in VR. And a boy, a maid, and a human-sized cat battle in an interstellar war.